You're watching It's What We Did, UNCA's long road to the NCAA tournament, sponsored by Ingalls. Wanting to win is not enough. Your, your opponent is nameless and faceless. The crowd got going a little bit, our guys got going, our energy got going, and hopefully that means we're getting a little bit closer. UNC Asheville family lost a member that's been with the basketball program for 21 years. Nick McDevitt is now the head coach at Middle Tennessee State University. As he was packing up his office today, he was kind enough to sit down with me and talk about the past, the future. You said that it would take a special place for you and your wife to even consider leaving Asheville. What about Murfreesboro made it that place? Well, you look at uh, what Middle Tennessee has been able to do. Um, what was the state of the program? the day, you know, that time period between Nick leaving and, and y'all settling on Mike? Um, I think the program was in, you know, it was solid. And when Nick says he's leaving, then we're on a search for a new men's basketball coach. The Mike Morrell era began at UNC Asheville today as the seventh basketball coach in Bulldog history he was introduced to the Bulldog faithful at the Ingalls Mountain View Room at the Sherrill Center at Kimball Arena. So why did he decide that Asheville was the place for his first head coaching assignment? When you talk about places that you see for your first head coaching opportunity, you want to be in a place that loves basketball, and this place loves basketball. And, you know, I've been fortunate to be at a few places similar, and uh, you know, this was just one that was a no-brainer for me. And honestly, when I came here, I was really excited about it. When I left, I had to have it. The opening day press conference is one that I remember because everybody was packed into the, the Mountain View room and that the search was over. It had been extensive. Lots of interviews, some former coaches uh, on the staff interviewed, and everybody's like, well, who is this guy coming in? And that day, I'll tell you that I was struck by the passion that Mike had for this job. Now, Macy Oteague is in the audience. He, of course, the all Big South sophomore guard who was given his release. And he was so excited to come here and get this opportunity to coach these kids. And, you know, I looked around, and there were some guys in attendance that we knew we're not gonna be around playing basketball when we got to opening day. You had a pretty darn good roster. Yep. You had Macy Oteague and Jonathan Bears. How realistic did you think it would be that those two guys in particular would stick around? Zero. I'll be honest, I, I, I kinda told them to leave, man. <laughs> I'll be honest, like. I remember everybody asking, what are you gonna do to get them to stay? Well, nothing. You know, that's their decision. You can't argue with the performance they had that year prior. And um, I told them this. I said, if you have an opportunity, I would consider it. Uh, I was I was like at a loss for world. Like, dang, I just got here. And uh, everybody, you know, coaches leaving, all my teammates. Well, most of my team, most of the team, they graduated and transferred anyway. But, like, the ones that was going to still be there, you know, they, le they left too. So, like, I was just like, whoa, what am I going to do now? <laughs> like, what? That was really my initial thoughts. Over and over, I, I like to tell our coaches and kind of give us, say, the first year is almost a mulligan year. Sometimes they don't believe me because they see other, other universities where coach, um, athletic directors, universities really don't give a coach a chance to develop a program. They want it now. What was interesting about that first year was that was Coach Morell's first year as a head coach. We had me and Don were the only two players on the roster who had ever played in a college game. And I had played, only played 20 games the year before and then had set out a year. So we were really working together on how we can build that foundation for UNCA basketball for the future and what it was eventually going to get back to. Assembling that freshman class was tough. One of the youngest rosters, the second youngest officially for that season in Division I basketball. When you walked out to your first practice where the team's going through things, what'd you think? We gotta get better. Uh, we gotta get more bodies. Um, we didn't have a point guard. <laughs> but I was having fun, man. 
my mind is always racing and I think that maybe is the biggest change between being an assistant and moving over to a head coach is um, you know, at the end of the day, you're just exhausted. <laughs> the, the first song with Coach Romero was, it was intense. He'll tell you himself, we butted heads more times than not. You know, Justice is, it's hot and it's sweaty, and I love it this time of year. You know, we come in here, we start at 6.30 in the morning, and we get after it. So this is kind of us right now. Faster, Chris! He was trying to implement that, that grit that, you know, there's no AC down there, so what? You know, he wanted to build that mentality. The first couple of days was tough. Um, guys, you know, throwing up, you know, the typical freshman thing. And we had guys. one drill that, that we had to do perfectly, and we didn't do it. It, like, took us exactly, like, 33 minutes to do. Like, we wouldn't move on until we did it perfectly, and that that was probably one of the craziest experiences I had with Coach Morrell. Like, we was out there gas trying to do this drill, so just to get these guys in the first, the it was intense. That was intense. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> you never know what you're going to do. He oh, doesn't man. let up but you do know you're gonna have high at all. Like, he does not let up. Like, okay, I'm just going to let him go over there and let him do what he does. No, it's, it's no, no, LJ, what are you doing? Like, it's, 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 it's constant. And, you know, I, at the time, I used to get mad about it, but. <laughs> I promise he just walked in. I, <laughs> I know that now. That wasn't a setup, I promise. He'll, he'll tell you himself he doesn't let up at all. And as you can see, I like to be right in the middle of it and like my coaches to be right in the middle of it. That was a, quite the welcome to Asheville uh, <laughs> collegiate basketball, you know, experience. Those guys were a bunch of guys who I knew had a lot of potential. And the hard part was I knew we, we didn't have enough to be a championship team. Like we were just young. We did not have that entire team together until I believe, if I'm right, it was August the 26th. I think it was the first day of class or something. I think everybody was excited to see what is the style of play going to be because of his background with Shaka Smart and how defense and full court press, the whole game, creating turnovers, that was going to be a staple for his ball club when you look back at VCU days and then at, at Texas with Shaka as well. And I got excited about what I was seeing as far as that upbeat style of play. And as we got through that game, I'm like, all right, well, it's going to be interesting to see how we do when we start playing some real competition. Well, the new era of UNC Asheville men's basketball started tonight. Mike Morrell's debut game as the Bulldogs head coach, replacing the highly successful Nick McDevitt. Tonight he tipped it off against NAIA St. Andrews. And the real competition came in with St. Andrews as the very first game. Shoots a little floater, it's good. He scored 14. Morrell wins his first game as head coach, 87-47. And then next up was NC State after that, and then that's when reality set in. We felt like we were onto something with the St. Andrews win, even though it was um, not, not a Division I school. Um, we were proud of it regardless. And so we went into NC State knowing the level of competition that we were going up against, but still confident that we could go in there and put up a good score and try to win the ball game. And, uh, you know, that was the first real slap in the face, like, <laughs> you know, th this is the big leagues. The reality that this team is very young, this team has a lot of inexperienced players, and when it comes time to get out there and go up against bigger teams, experienced teams, out of conference and in conference, uh, this has the potential to be a long season. Whenever you get to a college level, everyone has been on winning teams that have competed either high school or AAU. You know, you're, you're one of the better players, so you're always on winning teams. And when you have to transition to you know, when you go four and twenty-seven, you, you never think about that in college, and you really can see how everyone interacts when you're at your absolute lowest, how you are as a teammate, how you are as a person, um, and and I think that brought us closer together. I mean, it, it sucked at the time. You know, when you lose eight, nine in a row um, in those games, it, it, it's really tough. But it what kind of you know glued us together as a team, and we figured out you know who's going to be in that foxhole with you. UNC Asheville at home, quick start for the Bulldogs. Cody Jew drives the baseline, gives it up to Donovan Gilmore. He lays it in. What was the low point of that season for you personally? Sheesh. 
We lost a Division Two game. Lost a non-Division One game after Christmas. Crawford's going to get it in the corner, and he is going to drain the three. Hit a lot of those today as they start pulling away. At Good home run. against uh, Fayetteville State, and we didn't lose. We got we got our butts kicked. <laughs> I had a lot of low points that season, um, and. We, I think we lost as many as 12 or 13 in a row. But Richmond had 20 for Fayetteville State. And then I'll never forget it. So we, we played two games before we started Big South play that year. And we lost by, I think it was 16, uh, to a non-division one here at home. And they had an 11-point halftime lead. UNC Asheville cut it to one, but they couldn't sustain it. Division II Broncos win it 80-63. to I felt yeah, uh, terrible because, you know, I'm trying to be a mentor for these for the younger kids, you know, lead by example. But it, it was crushing me inside. And I just had to, you know, I, I think later that day, I actually went back to Pitchmill's office and we had to sit down and talk about just what just happened and how we're going to, you know, attack the next, you know, few games because we were about to go into the Big South Conference. I remember calling Mike Rhodes. And I was like, <laughs> Mike, like, and he goes, all right, listen, here's what, here's what I would do if I were you. Three things on offense, three things on defense, three things culturally that you want to accomplish every day. If you can just get better at those three things every single day, how much, you know, basically how much growth do you think you'll make? And that was like a real, like a, for whatever reason, as simplistic as that sounds, that was like this unbelievable eye-opening experience for me. So we go to Vanderbilt the very next game and played really, really well in terms of our capability. Um, like we were down like four at half, um, ended up losing by 20 some, but it gave us like a little bit of hope, right? And um, then we came here, the first conference game of the year, we played Winthrop at home. Opening Big South play with rival Winthrop in Kimmel Arena. Bulldogs cooking with gas in the first half. Cody Jude at the top of the key. Bottom, he hits three deep balls in the last two and a half minutes of the first half to help road. It's Michael Anumba who's going to toss it over to Charles Falden, and that three falls in. Ties the game up at 39, but this freshman squad keeps on fighting. And it was tied with like three to go. Devon Baker, and he's going to go all the way to the other end for a layup. That gives UNCA a four-point lead, but... And then the bottom fell out. They scored 15 unanswered to, to beat us by, I think it was 15. Part of a 61-point second half to down the dogs 80-65. to Seems like we keep saying it every game, you know, 30 minutes, 32 minutes. You know, today probably 36 minutes, and hopefully that means we're getting a little bit closer. It's like just, hey, we're, we're capable of more. And so I'm like, man, if we just find a way to steal a few here. And so we won at home versus upstate. We won on the road versus upstate. And we finished 10th out of 11th. And um, I'm like, I don't know if this is the right way. We didn't finish last. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, and, and we got, uh, you know, we had, had two Division I wins. I and mean, I didn't know if we were going to get a Division I win or not. That was one long season. Uh, that <laughs> we had to have a lot of good jokes ready to go in order to try to keep the audience going and keep them tuned in and entertained. Uh, it was tough. I mean, there was no doubt. All I can say is just remember, just if you're a Bulldog fan, Bulldog player, you remember this feeling. And he hits the, th the free throw, 106 to 56. A minute and 20 left. And when we were driving back, from the very last game of the season, which was the 27th loss of the season down at Presbyterian, it, there was a sense of, boy, uh, I'm glad this is over, and I hope things get better next year. I mean, yeah, because it, there was nowhere to go but up. And my hope that is, you know, 106 to 59 will be something that, that we, uh, we remember for a long time. There was some players we could see at that time that showed some flashes that, hey, they might be pretty good. 
Tajon Jones gets the rip, and he's going to coast all the way to the other end for a layup. He leads all scorers with 30 points tonight. We always knew what he had. I knew Tay's capabilities from the minute that I stepped on campus. We saw guys like Cody Jude. He's going to have to play center and really didn't have the body to match up against you know, you know, a lot of the big centers in the league. Dropping back to Cody Jude, he pulls the three-point trigger and nails it. But he had a good outside shot behind the three-point line, so we knew, okay, well, he's going to be a weapon. And then there's LJ Thorpe. Goes off the screen and splits the defenders and scoops up a little two-pointer. He had 24 to lead the home side, but they're still down the floor at that point. It was just things like that that I think really helped our team going into year two. The Bulldogs opened summer practice this week. They only lost two players from last year's squad and add two transfers and three freshmen. I had committed to Hofstra, I had my mindset. And after that, they told me they were going to hold off my commitment. And then my high school coach was like, no, we're, we're, we're not going to go through this process. We don't know if he really wants you or not. So I decommitted, I opened my recruitment back up. And Coach Morrell was the first coach to text me. Coach Morrell was very uh, strong. Like, he was very strong of like getting us here and helping me and Doc just coming in, not just to make the program just flip, but get better each year. Trent came in as he just won a state championship. So he, he knows how, what it's like to win like big games and stuff like that. So, and Doc, he, you know, he's always been one of our great defenders. So he bought that defensive toughness to our team as well. They are what I wanted the program to be about. And you cannot put the importance that it, that those two coming here meant. Trent Steffi, watch it here, gets it on the wing, drives, spins into the lane, tough finish. Year two, we started to see some of the payoff take place with his style of play the aggressiveness on defense, some great outside shooting from the guys from behind the three-point line, made it a fun brand of basketball to, to see. We started to get more wins, and you saw players like LJ Thorpe start to develop. LeVar was, was great at coming in and forcing turnovers. Uh, and then you started to see Cody and Tejan and some of these other guys really start to come into their own. We started learning that, you know, we can compete with anybody. First, it's little subtle things like you kind of go, this is working. Oh, it's getting better. And then you're standing over there going, wow, it really is working. You know, the philosophy, the culture's right. We had this thing, you know, this thing, what, it's what we do. And so he always said that to us and like knowing that at some point it will turn around. Coming out of year two, the single biggest thing we needed was girth in the middle. And I say in the middle around the rim. And man, we got it. Evan Claiborne's going to have it at the top of the key, puts his head down, and just about rips the rim off. The Thunder Dunk puts Well, my mom used to tell me uh, from high school on, just play with reckless abandon. <laughs> like, just, just play your heart out. Obviously, obviously you know what happened, but. <laughs> Evan kept wanting to, to, to get here. They kept wanting to get here and get here, and we were trying to figure it out over COVID. Everything was going on. So the first time I ever saw Evan um, in person, he had his shirt off, he was running, and I'm like, whoa, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about right there. That's the guy we, we need. Evan Claiborne came in as a transfer from North Carolina Central. He brought experience, he brought toughness, and he was a new dimension to this team that really benefited the Bulldogs. I remember talking to Tim White like every day. Tim, is, are the results in yet? Are the results in? Are, are we, all right, we got half the team. We're good, you know. Doc battle with the rejection. If like an exciting player ha uh, play will happen in COVID, it'll just be us cheering and we'll look around like, then I'll look up at the, the, the cutouts of my face. <laughs> That'll be like the only other faces in the gym other than the other team. There's not a lot of energy in the building when there's no fans, but I will say this much, the bench did a great job that year at creating noise and creating energy, because that's all you had. 
the Tatejan's going to fire a three at the buzzer. Yeah, oh there was a serenity of, like, that team, how much time we spent together because you didn't see anybody else. Here's some of what UNCA is doing in, in between games to keep everyone safe, sanitizing everything, including the backboards, even athletic director Janet Cohn donating a little elbow grease to the cause. You know, usually you play against a team. So for example, we played Longwood twice this year. We played them once in uh, January, and then we played them again in the last game of the season in February. You know, I think back to the game that we played against Longwood in COVID year, and they played one way <laughs> the first night, in a completely different style the second night. It was like the one year you don't even worry, you weren't even worried about injuries. He did what? He sprained his ankle, he's out today, okay, no problem. Like, you know, we we've been without three guys, you know. I mean it was it was something, man. I mean it was you talk about coaching. I mean you were you were spending as much time on COVID as you were, you know, finding a finding a way to execute your favorite play. So I would say that year we was on a pretty good roll as a team, man. Boom, like five of our players got COVID. We was out for the whole month of February. Remember, for student athletes and coaches, their one moment in time is every year, every day. It's not just in March where you get to be on the big stage because you don't know if you're going to have another year. I remember it like it was yesterday, Chris. It, 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 I still get the chills thinking about it. Yeah, I remember it, it was such a like, it was so impactful and like, like, I don't even know the word. All I saw was the ambulance and fire trucks coming and I, I just thought it was a drill at the school. I don't know, Chris, it was like a weekend to a pause. And we ha I believe we hadn't had any to where it was okay for us to come in and I think what we decided with Janet and Tim was like, okay, you can let your guys come in and, but don't rebound for them. And uh, just over, you know, just kind of be there. And we're sitting right down there, man. Like it, it, was, an it was a situation where we had just beat Winthrop, one of the, the only team in America to beat Winthrop that year. Um, and that was hard. You know, that was really hard. And, and Evan was a major part of that. They had DJ Burns at the time, and Evan completely took him out of that game. So we come back, we get COVID tested on that Sunday, and there's just an outbreak on our team. So we're done for about six days. I really remember the entire day kind of just being cloudy. But I remember whenever it was that we came back, we had individual workouts and we were working out one guy at a time. So there would be one person on this side of the court, one person on that side of the court, one coach over here, and one coach over there. And we had to literally talk to them from the stands because we couldn't be within six feet of them. So, so we're talking to them from the stands, directing them through a workout. I remember Evan was the guy that I was with. So I was down on this end of the court, kept my six feet, He's walking around and he says, man, coach, my feet are really tight. And I was like, hey, man, like, take a break. You know, if, if your feet are really tight, you know, take a break. He was like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Like, they just keep cramping. And I was like, OK. All right, like, man, go take a break. And he was like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. So he keeps going and everything seems fine. Like, we're thinking to ourselves, hey, you know, th this is just what it's about. You know, like, I haven't played basketball in 14 days. <laughs> it's my first workout. Yeah, your feet are going to be a little tight. Yeah, you're going to be a little bit tired. Um, and, and the next thing I know, he spins the ball to himself. He catches it. He looks. And then he just goes down and he just falls. And as he's falling, Coach Morell is sprinting from across the room, across the gym. E, Evan, E, Evan. And now Evan's down on the ground, he's out. You know, I, I uh, came running out from over there, and um, it was um, <laughs> just, you know, it was, um, he just collapsed. So now, obviously, the six feet is off. I'm sprinting to him, too. Our trainer got there. I can't remember exactly, like, how long. It was like, you know, within 30 seconds, probably. 
and she knew it as soon as she got there. Um, and um, we started doing CPR. So now we've got the AED, we've got Evan on his back. This is all within 45 seconds, Chris. So this all happened, bam. So now coach is outside on the phone with the EMS. Eliza's in here. We've got Evan hooked up to the AED and it's such an eerie feeling, Chris, because it's saying, wait, wait, wait. Stand clear, shock advised, administering shock. And then Eliza would click the button, boom, shock administered, and now we're back in CPR. He's obviously in cardiac arrest. Um, and I don't know how many minutes it was. Um, and so, uh, you know, just thinking back on it, um, you know, it's an experience that, like, you, like you, obviously you never forget. Um, so Mike V, our assistant coach, is pushing. He's pushing. He's pushing. Eliza jumps in. She's pushing. She says, "Hey, I, I can't get deep enough. I'm not getting enough oxygen to his heart. I'm not, or whatever the technical term is, but I'm not getting deep enough down in there." So now she's like, "Mike V, you got to take over." And Mike V's pressing, and the whole time I'm just rubbing Evan's head. Come on, man, you're gonna be all right. You're gonna be all right, man. Come on, E. Come back to us, E. Come back to us, E. Come back to us, E. Nothing. All right, clear. We do that for a minute. Shock advised. Shock being administered. Boom. Hit him again. Back into CPR for six for about ten or twelve minutes. We did that before the EMS was able to arrive. You know, and then I remember going to the ER with Eliza, and uh, we went back into the emergency room and eat. They led us back there. Um, he just had all the, he was hooked up to all these machines and, um, and he, uh, he was in a tough spot. But I know that once he got to the hospital, they said that he was still flatlined. Um, and for 67 minutes, 67 minutes, a young man was no longer with us. We, um, there was nobody, I mean, there was like nobody in the hospital at the time. He was on this floor. And so nobody was in waiting rooms. You weren't, you had to go through like this unbelievable process to get like in, actually into the hospital at the time. And um, I remember just setting up shop up in that, up in the waiting room on his floor. And um, um, just the being there for days. And speaking a warrior, Every day got better. So. so initially when it happened, I woke up two days later and my mom, I, and I heard my mom's voice immediately. I started crying. Like, I don't, my eyes are closed. I just hear my mom say, squeeze my hand. I started squeezing immediately. I, I just felt like I was out of it for a couple of days. The, the next day was just like, we didn't do anything. We, 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 we didn't shut down the program, but it was like we stopped working out. Everything else was second to what the situation was happening. Basketball was like the furthest thing from our mind. Um, nobody, you know, obviously really knew what was going on. Our players did. But, man, I didn't care about basketball, man. I cared less. True to form, man, once he started getting better, it was like he didn't just start getting better. It was he's doing he's doing what? <laughs> it said I wouldn't walk for two weeks to a month. Two days later I ended up walking. It said I wouldn't run for three months, I think. Right when I got out of the hospital, I was jogging. They said I wouldn't play basketball for six months against the doctor's orders. I was playing against LJ a month out of the hospital. <laughs> Uh, and, so, <laughs> and Coach Merrill kicked me out the gym. The following week, uh, we were playing one on one, and he like let me hop in. I'm like Evan. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like Evan. No, <laughs> I'm like no, dog. I don't know. Uh, it was it was more so like I think after it happened, dying wasn't that big of a deal to me because it was basketball. It was my life. It was like I, I'll I'll go out playing this game. As, as reckless as that sounds.
the guys that were here as freshmen, when they got to their senior year or their last year of eligibility, they had grown up so much. And that team had just been together for so long. You just knew, everybody knew that the ins and outs of everything. I'll get down on defense, Thorpe gets the theft. LJ Thorpe was someone that at the end of the game, under five minutes to go, you couldn't stop the guy. Tajon Jones goes wild. Tajon had blossomed into a really good three-point shooter. Later, it's Cody Jude at the top of the key. He lines it up. And Cody Jude was just always going to be Cody. The Four players from last year transferred out. In came three transfers and a freshman. Former Tennessee Vol Drew Pember played with point guard Trent Stephanie in high school. So there's a little. I saw that he had, was coming into Asheville, that he was going to be transferring. And then the first time that I saw him play here in Kimmel, I was like, wow. OK, this is impressive. Man, there's not a lot of there's not a lot of people that know that, but my uh, my freshman year of uh, of college at Tennessee, um, it was Christmas. I was at Waffle House with my dad. I just like broke like broke down crying. Like I like dad like I can't do this. Like the the physicality, the mental toll, like all everything that was going on. I told my I told my dad like I, I can't do this. Like I have to work a nine to five. Like I like I was dead set on working a nine to five. I don't want to say COVID helped, but it did because I kind of, uh, I got away from basketball um, and then it started to fall back and fall back. And I mean, now, now I'm at where I'm at, man. You know, I, when you fall in love again, you, you, know, you want to work out, you want to keep being successful. He had some, you know, some, some, a lot of schools interested in him. I just think he had this perspective of what he wanted it was almost like, where did you get this kid? <laughs> I mean, he was like a secret, you know, or something that, that uh, he stole away. We knew he was good. We didn't know he was going, going to have this type of, of impact. Drew Pember gets into the lane, bucket, and one. He led everyone with 24. Drew Pember gets it in the corner, drives baseline using every ounce of his 210 pounds. Drew Pember getting roughed up like a broken rock and sock and robot that sneaks a pass to Doc Battle. One of the first conversations we had, like, you know, I, I can play 15, 16 minutes. I've been, wor I've been working hard. All I want to do is just get on the court. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think we'll be. Thank you. I think we can handle that. The Bulldogs will begin the season on the road at UAB. The Blazers are one of the consistently good mid-major programs and we'll have a ton to test Morell's squad. And we them all were anticipating him coming back and playing at UAB. Like, we're all on the bus on the way there. Like, we're all talking about how, you know, Evan's going to come back. I'm back in the starting lineup. Like, I'm back in, you know, that, that was the plan. Then the day of, like, we yeah, sit there and, like, we're going through our uh, personnel and everything. There was, like, Evan not going to be able to play. And then before the game, it was just Evan's not going to be able to play this game. And so for us to get the news on the bus that, like, yeah, guys, Evan isn't going to play. We're like, man, like, it was rough. He had a, um, obviously, a defibrillator, and they were tracking it, and he had a couple episodes that he just weren't going to clear him to play. And so we uh, we get there, and we have a sit-down with Eliza, our trainer, and him, and he tells me, he's just, you, I can see it in his eyes, the pain, and uh, he just started tearing up, and it was it was an experience, but I think other than me, he was he was the one going through it the most just because we were so close. We had recruited with the hopes that he'd be back and surrounding again more more guys that could help us win. And then when we lost him at the literally last moment, um, from a from a basketball standpoint, it hurt. But Evan was was a very important piece emotionally to this team, and that was you know again unexpected and, and it hurt us in many ways. It felt like not everything was happening over again, but I felt so bad for him because it's like, dog, you, you worked your way back through everything that happened. You working out normal. You, you're not thinking anything of what happened. You're just working out, getting better. And then you're excited to play again after almost a year. Then the day of, basically, you get a call like you're done. The school's lawyers had called and said everything hadn't, wasn't uh, going through the way it was supposed to. Um, 
and then some doctors are called and just said they wanted to wait a little while and a little while turned to a long while. And so I just asked him, I straight up, you know, I came to his office because that's my guy. I was just like, am I, or is, is the school ever going to let me play again? <laughs> he was just like, no, I don't, I don't think so. And, you know, that's where we gave him a hug because that's, like I said, that's my dude. We sat there, cried together just a little bit. <laughs> then, and then, uh, yeah, and that was just the end of my season right there. The kid had so much tough luck, man, and he didn't deserve it. But, you know, my hope is, like, obviously for him, as he grows older, you know, he finds, you know, he finds that to really be the time in his life that makes him into the person he is. Man, he's just a, be he's just a beautiful person, man. UNCA opening the year at UAB. First half, LJ Thorpe on the dribble drive. Going to take a little contact, or a lot of contact, but he gets the bucket. UNCA trails 15-14 there, but the players will get hot. An 11-0 run in the second, redoing the dogs as UAB rolls to a 1 0 Evan and Drew together, you know, the best version of Evan. Uh, that could have been a, a real, real potent lineup. And so what it did was, is it, it, uh, it moved Drew to the five. Doc Battle goes to work in the post, goes through the 7-1 du jour Dickens for the hoop, 52-43 UNCA, and they buck the home jinx with a 69-53 win. UNCA rolls to a 101-44 win. As UNCA cruises to a 114-54 win, Bulldogs winning 82-59, bittersweet. I don't know that I've ever been more shocked and disappointed at the outcome of a game a chance to make it than that right game. in the conference tournament as the five seed Bulldogs face bottom seed Charleston Southern in the tournament opener. That, that game half, was a lot of ups and downs. You know, uh, Early first half, Trent Stephanie hits Tajon Jones on the wing and the marksman knocks down the three. Asheville leads 15 to five. I mean, I I think I, I was I was pretty hot too. I think I had like 15 points, 16 minutes. Like we were like we were flowing well. We were moving. L.J. Thorpe drives, steps back, and cans two of his team high 18 for a 25-12 UNCA lead. It was like okay, we're up. Like, let's try to knock him away. Thorpe gets the rip on one end, heads this way, and then drops back to Drew Pember for the fast break jam. 57-49. Pember had 16. To have Butter that game boil down to having your best player sitting on the bench after fouling out and getting a technical, which Drew Pember, that might, I think, is the only technical that he has gotten. They call the foul, and I like, I, I remember I remember just waving my hand. I'm like, there's just no, there's no way that's a foul. No way that's a foul. So, I, you know, they, whatever happens, they call the foul, boom, I get hit with a tech, and I'm Muskie like, you know, like, what? Muskie all the way down, bounce pass to the corner. Moore fires a three, off the mark, tipped up. Tipped up at the buzzer and it counts. It was terrible. It was it was one of my all-time lowest moments in basketball. Just one rebound could have stopped it. Cause it's tough, you know. It's the last game, last last every day, last time I'm gonna be in the in in the building. So it was it was tough, man. And folks, the season is over. You know that changes that that changes you. Things like that change you. Wow. Can you believe this? I remember his visit. He actually came in and made me debit. I'm not sure what else he had on the table, but you know, he was a very reserved guy. Um, he played pickup with us. He played pretty good, man, but uh, he was nervous. You know, Shay, he was just. A guy looking for opportunity. Tay, I think, first time we ever weighed Tay when I was here, he's like 173, 175. To go through that transition of not playing under the previous coaching staff when he was redshirting, and then to go into a situation with a, a new staff. That first year I shot like 28%, so like me shooting 28 that year like really kind of brought me down because I'm like, damn, this is what I'm supposed to do. but. Even when I was shooting like that, Coach, I'm like, you're the best shooting a big style. To start as a freshman, to stick with it all the way through, then you hit COVID, then you hit transfer portal, all these options that he could have taken 
to go somewhere else. I think it just shows his love of the school, his love of the program, and the fact that he wanted to finish it out and go out on top. And that's, you gotta give him all the credit in the world to be the kind of guy that wants to do that, and, and it shows. He chose Asheville time and time and time again, not for his own selfish game, but because he believes in this place. So we go into the off season with like a mindset of, we just gotta, we gotta figure this out. When it came time to start this season, I think the first thing that hit me was, this is now an old, experienced team. I felt like we had enough pieces in place in certain areas that were good enough to win the league. I felt like we were deficient in other areas that we could be very strategic with in terms of what we were looking for in recruiting. Caleb Burgess off with the fadeaway, but the ball bantied about. Nick McMullins dives on it, gets it back to Burgess, who then tosses it to Drew Pember for the hammer drop. We couldn't just bring in random guys. They had to fit. Fletcher Aby launches the fast break three. Fletcher Aby. You know, I was told multiple times by college coaches, you know, we, we just don't know if he can guard at this level. And that has always been in my mind uh, from the time I've been in college up until now. He is one of those guys defensively and uh, that would disrupt things. And he does all the things that coach talks about that don't show up in the stat sheet. Into the second, Caleb Burgess barrels across the lane. Get I came around, I was like, hey, as long as I can get to where I need to and make defense help and have to guard me, I know they're gonna knock down the shots, man. Right, Caleb Burgess, his style of play at point, we haven't seen that physical toughness since Kevin Venato was, was here. Finds Nick McMullen for the jam, 47. As you had everything except for like a piece like me, so I just felt like that also would help with like just the significance I could play. Nick brought a toughness along the front line and it enabled Drew to be able to go out and not have to be locked down the paint. UNCA goes from four in 27 in 2018 to the top of the Big South regular season champs after Radford lost 75 to 60. <laughs> Have your hands ready. We jump stop, we hit singles, we'll get layups. Remember, they go for everything. Right. When it came time for the Big South Conference Tournament, the first game against Charleston Southern was a rematch of what we had the, the year before. What an opportunity to play Charleston Southern again this year. And that was, you know, and that was kind of the, the approach that we had. It's like, I don't want to say like revenge, like, Revenge isn't really the word, but like there's motivation outside of just winning the game. Like last year, they, they took us out. We knew that game was going to be a battle. Uh, just with their personnel and their guard play, they're tough. How much is last year going to be in the guys' heads? And I think at the start of the ball game, it was in their heads. They started on an 11-0 run when we came back. And then I remember in the second half, they got a shooter, uh, Chavez. He draws two fouls on back-to-back three points. And I'm like, no way. They, it's no way they're coming back again. We're missing a lot of chippies early, a lot of layups we missed, a lot of open threes we normally make. It was like, we just got buckled down on defense. We like, not again. Lock in, like, defend. We're not worrying about offense right now. Stop them from scoring, and we'll be good. We'll be just fine. Offense comes, obviously we got players to take care of that. When the light bulb went off, boom, 32 to nine run. We end up up by 12 at the end of the first half, 32 to 20. It was almost like, okay, we're here in this building where we were disappointed last year. Now we've overcome the obstacle. We've beaten this team that beat us last year. What's next?
Here comes Upstate. Upstate is a chance for another payback game. It was a regular season loss, one of only two losses for the team down in Spartanburg. And that was a game where the Bulldogs didn't play well. And Upstate has two of the best guards in the conference, maybe in college basketball with Broadnax and with Ganey. They came out playing well. It was going to be tough. But once they got over the hump, settled down the second half, got a four point win, then you sort of feel like, okay, the tough part might be over. We're to the championship game. We watched them beat Longwood first. We watched them beat Radford. So we was like, oh yeah, it's not going to be no cake while we got to come out to play. I gotta be honest, as you look back on that game, 33 minutes of that game, Campbell was by far the better team. They were manhandling Drew down low. We were cold at times behind the three-point line. Fletcher A.B. started out great, then he disappeared. They were milking the shot clock. They were hitting every shot as the buzzer was expiring. They were getting every loose ball. We couldn't get a break after some missed shots. And then at about the eight minute mark, I told Mike Gore, Tajon Jones only has five points. For whatever reason, there's this one moment that's like just ingrained in my mind you know, from that last, from that second half. We're in the huddle, in the second to last media, and there's 7.39 on the clock. And I just remember looking up at the scoreboard, and it's like, we didn't talk a thing about an X or an O. Nobody ever talks about a last minute shot unless somebody makes the shot. And so if you don't have really good players, you can draw up all you want, but it's not going to matter. Hey, if we're going to go out, man, let's go out being the aggressors. Air everything you do over the course of the next eight minutes, 739, error on the side of aggression. Whether it's running through a passing lane, like just error on the side of aggression. If you, like at this point, that's the only chance we have. Only saying with four, here's Tejon at the other end. Top of the key, stops, fires a three, got fouled, and he hit the shot! Four-point play opportunity coming up for Tay. When you come back, you need breaks, and there's a break there. Tay's just starting to feel just a little bit. 68-62, 4.23 left to go. For like a split second, I kind of got nervous. I'm like, yo, like they're, they're trying to pull away on us, you know, like it's the championship game, this is for everything, but I had to snap out of that real quick. For it to be him. Somebody's writing it, you know, it's kind of like something else is going on here because I ain't pulling the strings over here. <laughs> After as long as he'd been here and all that he's been through here and the ups and downs, I mean, that was one of the most unbelievable moments that I've been a part of as a coach. And just to see him kind of take over like he did, it was amazing. Like, we've been telling him to take those exact kind of shots for the longest, bro, like, and so he can, he can literally do that at any time he wants. Climb in the second free throw. It's up and too strong and a rebound to Nick McMullen. Got numbers, got numbers. Nashville can take the lead. Here's Tajon ahead to Burgess. Back to Tajon. Stops, fires for three. Yeah! Yes! Bulldogs lead. Get back, get back, get back, get back. 75-73 Bulldogs, 46 seconds left. And then Tay scores 13 straight. Next thing you know, Jews at the free throw line shooting and we're up four. And I'm like, 
we were good. <laughs> you know, we're really right there. You know, we're about to make this happen. And that horn went off and we was champs. I'm just like, yo, like, we did that. Like, we did it. To have the guts and just the mental fortitude to say we are not going to lose, I, I think it was it was special and it really capped off a great year. So I told you, like I don't, we don't use the word hope around here. Like there's a difference between faith and hope. We don't want to go into a game hoping that we're going to win. Um, we don't want to go into a season hoping we're going to do well. We want to have faith. I think to truly get this work, we've got to develop that faith. Um, because I was hoping, <laughs> there were a lot of days I was hoping. We basically had a same brick by brick. And you know, we, we weren't going to build the house overnight but we were laying the foundation. And so as I was sitting up there and I'm watching them win and I'm watching them um, have success uh, in Charlotte, I mean, that's uh, was reoccurring in my head. It was like a load taking off my back. Like, I'm happy for these guys, man. Like, especially like for Coach Morrell, I know he wanted this for so long and, and I'm, I'm happy he can finally say that he, you know, regular Big South Championship. And man, I, I'm happy for those guys, man. As a hooper, I'm like, I didn't do anything, but like they, they put that work in to get there. But I do feel like the guys that I played with, I did have somewhat at least, you know, somewhat of an impact on. And, you know, I still talk to those guys all the time. So as much as I didn't feel like I put the work in for this, I, I do, uh, I do hope I help my old teammates and help them grow kind of to this point. We've had our ups and downs, but that, that journey was, felt like it took forever. Like it was, but it was a great one though. It's some that I remember for the rest of my life, you know, being that four in 2017 to being a team that won 27 wins, so. When you start falling back in love, you just have more and more fun. And this year was fun uh, to, to say the, you know, say the least. And that's outside of all the scoring. That's, that's in the locker room. That's watching film, that's bus rides, that's, team bond like all that like that's you know the hiking the hiking you know thing we went on earlier this summer um but that's that's how you fall in love with basketball again I think people know what we do now. <laughs> what does it's what we do mean? I don't know. I've never been asked that before. Uh -oh. What we do. <laughs> Oh man, it's what we do means um, we're going to perform at a high level. Um, kind of like a, a segue outside of that. A, a question he used to ask us on practice every day, me specifically. What's the definition of response? And it's the ability to focus on the next most important thing. And that's what we do. We focus on what's important. We get it done. We do the right thing. We treat people right. We move with pride, integrity, and strength. So that's the bulldog way. That's what we do. I've never, I've never thought about that before. I've never, it's just always been a staple in this program when I got here. You know, I never heard a team like, it's what we do on three, you know? Um, you know, we, we love each other, we respect each other. We're aggressive, pick up four, you know, pick up 94 feet, play hard for 40 minutes. Frankly, you know, it's kind of like IWWD. Well, nobody's gonna know what that stands for. I kind of like that. I don't know, this, this is a tough question. I've never, you kind of caught me off guard. I don't really know. Um,